Um, so mononormativity is basically all the things, all of the things that push us to be monogamous or set up monogamous as the normal thing in culture. It's like how we think about love and how love is always thought about as monogamous, right? And then it's um, structures in the culture as well, like the legal structures that never recognize more than one other person in the relationship and so on and so forth. Um, okay. And the main thing I want to say about the history of monogamy, which is what makes this really brief, is that it was for women in Western culture. Um, it was really, uh, you know, a system of control of women and women's sexuality uh, up until, well, it's actually sort of hard to set the date. Um, monogamy in Western culture has been around for a while, and I forget the exact sort of time scale, but like uh, certainly over five or six hundred years. In a state where men more or less owned women, um, you know, the enforcement only goes one way, right? Uh, and so men historically have had access to non-monogamy until women had money. But also, and this is very interesting, monogamy has been around for a long time. Uh, what that means is that there's been a building structure, right? Concepts, conceptual apparatus is not sort of created in a vacuum, it is built. It's built on other concepts. And so we have all these concepts around a relationship, love, commitment, trust, uh, respectability, morality. These were all built on top of sexual monogamy. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yes, yeah, so my name's Jessica Keane. I'm from Sydney University in Australia. Um, apologies, Linda, you just said that you quite enjoyed my lively conversation, my lively talk yesterday. Modern normativity positions long-term, emotionally intimate, romantic and sexually monogamous relationships as stable, mature, mature, fulfilling and good. These characteristics act as a kind of significance package deal, working together to secure both institutional legitimacy and social legibility. Monogamy is both an item on that list and the list's key referent. A quality one aspires to and one that implies or promises a host of other qualities. Quite often in mononormative culture, significant, serious and monogamous are assumed to be more or less synonymous. The importance of a relationship is assumed to reside or be reflected in the relationship's exclusivity. In this relationship logic, monogamy is understood as a good in and of itself, but also insofar as it promises or entails commitment, longevity, security and love. A vow of monogamy is understood as a signal that a relationship is valued, and ongoing fidelity is understood as a signal that a relationship is functional, stable and likely to last. So mononormativity is all of that, and it's often strongly attached to the idea of compulsory monogamy, which is that monogamy is not a choice. We are not given a choice to be monogamous. We, it might be presented as a choice, but the choice has been made for us in numerous ways already, um, and it's very difficult to go against that. Um, so I'm going to go through a series of in-relationship mechanisms here. Uh, and the first one, the first ones, are actually sort of what I think of as the jealousy and cheating mechanisms. Jealousy itself is a power move, you know, it's not just an emotion. Um, jealousy demands action, the way the culture sets it up, it demands action from your other partner. Um, uh, and similarly, I, we tend to think of cheating as a fairly straightforward situation, but there are many opportunities for power, is the way I like to think about it, uh, in the cheating situation for everyone, including the person being cheated on. These are sort of like monogamous power mechanisms. They come to us from the system of compulsory monogamy. They are, I would, say sort of just part and parcel, like inseparable. Um, and they are always available. They are available if you are non-monogamous as well, but they are certainly available if you're monogamous. The enforced, social enforcement of coupledom creates an in-relationship enforcement of coupledom in many ways that gives people a lot of control over each other. Um, and then of course there are sort of final motivators such as the threat of breakup or divorce if a person is insufficiently monogamous to you um, and discrimination in the courts when that does happen. You, you know, I sort of include all these things as the basics, and they are, of course, terrible. <laughs> the basics are terrible. Um, but they're the things that we easily recognize as enforcement of compulsory monogamy, like you'll lose your job, you know, I, my name is all over the internet, I will never run for office. <laughs> Except maybe in San Francisco. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. Um, and I want to call out specifically monogamy in media Right? Like, think sitcoms, right? Think infidelity stories in sitcoms where the infidelity never quite happens and everyone's like, sort of moves on and is happy at the end of the half hour, right? The enforcement is, as I think of it, shrill. Um, 
And that, tell, and that sort of points to a thing that is happening, which is that we are sort of always being reindoctrinated into the ethos of monogamy. Like many other systems of power, like uh, heterosexism, for example, compulsory monogamy really operates as an unexamined norm. Uh, the way we talk about an unexamined norm is we talk about everything around it, right? You know, Foucault's perverse implantation. Uh, we, and in the case of monogamy, we talk about cheating and deviance. So if you look, if you turn on the TV or what have you, you do not hear, like, monogamy is like this for me. This is why I like monogamy. Monogamy is great because of these qualities, right? You never hear monogamy is great because of these qualities, <laughs> right? And there are, let me tell you, the free time, the free time I would have, <laughs> right? And so in some ways, the entire culture is talking about monogamy by talking about non-monogamy in the inverse. So if non-monogamy is deviant or dirty or pornful, then uh, monogamy is clean and normal and, you know, not at all pornful, I guess. <laughs> and we see this show up in jealousy, right? Like jealousy is the thing that everyone is supposed to have and yet no one is supposed to admit to having because being jealousy, jealous is sort of a kind of weakness. And I feel like in some ways that's historical because you know, men got to be non-monogamous and the jealous people were women and so we associate jealousy with women and so on and so forth. And so if monogamy is an unexamined norm, then the maintenance of the unexamined norm requires that all other possibilities be in fact impossible. And, and so there's this impossibility of non-monogamy that I think is very crucial to the way compulsory monogamy functions in the culture. You know, there's sort of this effort to maintain the impossibility of non-monogamy, of all non-monogamies, including infidelity, right? Um, and, and, and there's this sort of like collapsing technique where, you know, uh, first of all, the whole thing is impossible. But then if some part of it is possible, it's actually this other part that is perhaps different or not desirable or impossible, right? And so, you know, there's this thing, like if you, work with the media around non-monogamy or polyamory, you've probably seen the term legitimized infidelity or something like that. And it's like, oh, well, we're going to understand this by actually making it into cheating. Non-monogamy is actually cheating. Uh, and also, I just want to say there's a general deauthorization of non-monogamous people. Because in order to maintain the impossibility of non-monogamy, you certainly can't listen to non-monogamous people who are actually doing it and making it possible. In some ways, the, the polyamorous media single like biggest media victory is to get people to listen to non-monogamous folks.